Bro, why'd they make this like Hans Zimmer sh Hey Hassan, we know you're going to react to this video, so we want to invite you to be in an episode of Metal Ground. Maybe a one-on-one -on -one discussion with someone like Ben Shapiro. So it'll be great if you can announce your participation here first and we can get Ben's attention. For now, enjoy the video. It sounds like what you're saying is you want to be able to introduce all ways of life. Yes. So would it be okay to include a book with a man having a relationship with a 12 year old in that book? I know See, it's extreme. No. Hold on, but just no, hear me out. Because now hear you're equipped getting gay people to no, pedophiles. No, no, I'm, this is why I'm bringing it up. Is who establishes the boundary? The law. But, I think it's important to recognize that individuals will have political agendas. Yeah. It's a natural thing and people should understand their political views. I think where we need to differentiate it is whether a teacher should have a political agenda in a classroom. But is your idea of a political agenda like these teachers telling students this is who you should vote for, if you vote for these people it's wrong. Yes, if you vote or for these ridiculing people, it's right. the beliefs that they may have for political or religious reasons and uh, using their position of authority to mold the minds of everyone else. When it comes to diversity or these new sort of terms, I am not for certain types of uh, so-called diversity uh, when it comes to uh, these new these new kind of topics. And Could you expand upon that? Like what do you think uh, should Like critical be race theory or some of the gender ideologies. It's not diverse if you're the teacher, the person of authority in the classroom, and you are saying this is how something should be. Yeah, so, so I come from an elementary perspective. Uh, I'm a first grade teacher, so the conversations we're having in class isn't about the socioeconomic nature of the world. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we do talk about just what it looks like for different people in different communities. Uh, so when I talk about a political agenda, uh, the agenda that I have in the classroom is to create an environment where folks are able to you know, better understand from wherever someone's coming from. The problem with that, and I understand the, the, the sentiment, as a teacher, if, you, if a child is sitting there and they happen to be black, and you're saying, well, black people, such and such and such. I mean, you're really, that's yeah, not I, okay. I do have to stop you there, because that's not really said. It's not said black people do this. Well, it's I'm not just, said it's Mexicans do this. Again, it's, it's trying to understand from multiple perspectives. That's not saying that every group aligns on the same thought. That's not saying every group is a monolith. What it's saying is, even if you disagree with somebody or you come from a different tradition or a different cultural background, those people's opinions can still be valid. And the disagree step forward. I'm gonna be honest, as a teacher, especially after COVID and all of that, I don't have time for a political agenda. <laughs> I'm here trying to catch up with curriculum, pick up my readers that are, you know, two, three grade levels behind. I do not have time for that. I teach social emotional skills and all of that but I'm not here to kind of, you need to believe this, 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 and that. No, if you're a good person, we're good, we're gravy, all good, you know what I mean? But your definition, and sometimes this can happen and it becomes political, is what is your definition of a good person? Mm. Would you think that I'm a good person because I'm raising my kids to be with Judeo-Christian values and they live in a heterosexual, heteronormative home where we talk about how divorce is wrong, cheating is wrong. We have friends of the LGBT community, but we teach our children that from a biblical perspective, that's not okay. Your definition of whether or not they are good could be very different than my definition of whether or not they are good. To kind of clarify, in my classroom, if they're kind and they're not bashing anybody, judging anybody, kind of throwing out names, anything like that, they're good. It's not to say that topics like that don't come up in class. And I do open it up to discussion. I just keep it clear that we're, this is a safe space. We don't judge each other. We're not going to bash each other. I understand you have your own experiences, but we're not going to come in with an agenda, you can say. And I feel like this idea of parents and their teachers of their political biases and all of this is just all of this fear that is clouding their judgment, clouding. Except we have, yeah. we have numerous, not just. We have experiences. We have, yeah, my not own just, yeah. child. First week of school, what pronouns you wanted to go by? I mean, not what's your favorite subject? How can I help you succeed academically? Who's to say that wasn't a part of the questions too, you know? 
and understand that question could stand out. So maybe you don't understand that you're teaching politics. But that's not politics. That's just like basic respect. So, yeah, that's, I think that's beautiful. That's, but not true. Me. That's beautiful. Not think, to me. So I think you need to, your idea that that's basic respect. What is the framework of that? Because I think that many teachers are going through these trainings, and the trainings are saying this is the framework of how we operate in the classroom. But where did that idea come from? Is because what it's we're based off. To. It's called a thing. It's called a thing called data. Did you so do a lot that? Of, no, no. Hold on. A lot of schools have research and development, and so the state also does. So in the state of California, we do research. So the, at the end of the day, my job is not just to make your kid to feel comfortable. I got 55 students. I got to make 55 students feel comfortable. And so when your kid comes home and tells you, well, mom, the teacher said, what's my pronouns? Yeah, I did say, what's your pronoun? I also said, what's your favorite TV show? What's your favorite food? I am a college professor now. I was previously a third, fourth grade teacher. Teaching third and fourth grade was horrible. Dealing with parents who thought their child was special and should be treated a certain way. It just wasn't doable, the constant complaining, the accusing people of doing things that are not going on in our classes, not being enough for their child, uh, it was just too much. When parents don't have the knowledge of what goes on inside of a school, I think it's important for those parents to go to the school, and we as educators like our parents to be involved. You know, again, I, I have too many students to push an agenda. I just, I do my job, what they pay me to do. I had a sex ed class when I was in third grade, and it was quite simple. Boys go in this room, girls go in this room, they play a little video on a black and white TV. You know, you see the, the genitalia, and you're like, oh God, I got one of those, cool, now we're figuring out what I am. The fear is these schools have no boundaries. Like, if they do the classroom thing where they want to split kids up, what, how many genders are we going to do this? Are we going to put boys, um, them, and then girls, and then how many rooms do we need to create for equality? Are we really chasing equity? And I think parents now are beginning to realize we've got to stop this and create framework about sexuality, especially in a hyper-sexualized culture. My kids don't need to know at six, seven, and eight years old about different types of sexual acts. That's not appropriate. People think that this is just kind of happening, it's a one-off. It is in so many schools. Uh, where I live in Florida, there was a poster going around where kids could text anonymous strangers to get information about sex. And on this poster, in school, wanna get laid? Wow. I mean, this is, it's beyond, and, and there is a push for pleasure-based sex. Pleasure for who? My oldest is nine years old. She's in third grade and she's been exposed to things and we do have conversations about it, but that's a conversation that I should be having with my nine-year-old daughter. If a sixth grader or a fourth grader is gonna be prompted by a teacher, hey, what are your pronouns? As a parent, I should have a heads up about that because they're not even gonna understand the question. And so I think that the idea that those conversations are started in the classroom instead of in the home is a big problem. I have a family member who first day of sixth grade was asked for her pronouns and she stood up and said that as a person of faith, she believed that God didn't make a mistake making her a girl, and so therefore she identified as a she, her, and she was sent to the principal's office and punished for that decision. Thankfully, we haven't seen that broadly yet, but I think it's really damaging to take a shy, innocent, 11-year-old child and make them stand in front of a classroom and determine something that they maybe haven't even put that much thought into. Uh, I like what you said, Sean, about how you were uh, emphasizing you know, how a lot of parents today felt a goodness of the way that sexual education was conducted in the past. Uh, so there is an agreement that sexuality should be talked about in schools. Uh, the disagreement is whether it should just be purely heteronormative or if we should include all aspects of sexuality. Um, I don't think that we're doing demonstrations to encourage children how to have sex, uh, but this is something that we are trying to, again, educate and make them aware that this kind of things happen. And while you grow up, you're gonna have to experience somebody who's of this orientation. Kids are so. naturally curious, and I think that what I'm hearing from you is I understand where you're, you're maybe potentially coming from, but then where's the line between that sex education and introducing them to porn? Because porn can be educational. I was a virgin when I got married, and I, for years I was made fun of and heard, well, how are you gonna know if you don't try it? We hear that a lot too. If you haven't tried to kiss a girl to see if you like it or not, then how do you really know that you're not a lesbian? How do you really know that you're not gay if you've never slept with a guy? How do you really know that you wanna be in a monogamous relationship if you don't sleep around? And when you start to introduce those questions to children, specific, specifically prepubescent ones, they're going to naturally be curious and their emotional and hormonal maturity is not there to be making those types of decisions that have lifelong impact. 
Well, you're right, and a lot of them are learning at home because just like you guys are saying, they come home to tell you things. Well, guess what? Those same kids come to school to talk about what you're telling them at home. You'll be surprised what I hear from students when I do a what do you think. Well, let me tell you what my mama and daddy did. And look, I don't, I don't, I don't have time. Your kid is not that important to me, not to be rude. I got like 300 students. Your kid is no more important than the other 299. So I don't have time to sit up here and uh, let me get you to think like me. I, I can't get my own 23-year-old to think like me at the end of the day. What needs to happen, and this is just my own personal take, parents need to start being parents, because a lot of times the teachers are the parents. They're parenting your kids because absentee parenting. I think that this conversation is really interesting, and I think we need to step back and look at why we automatically assume that if we're telling our children about lesbians, gay people, queer people, why do we immediately equivocate that to telling them about what sex is? That can just be something as simple as, here is a book. In this book, there are two dads. This book character has two dads. And kids, they can be inquisitive and that's good, right? But also like, they're gonna be like, cool, there's two dads. All these kids know that there's a dad right. and a dad and a right. mom and a mom and the yeah. culture is teaching all of that. So what we've noticed is that the curriculum in eighth grade and up is a lot deeper than that. It's more like, here is how you can have sex so you do not get pregnant. Yeah. Illustration of anal sex. That is the stuff that we are now reacting against. And, and that sadly is the, the trust that's being broken between teachers and parents. Yeah, and I think we're moving into a conversation about comprehensive sex ed. What I am talking about is when I go into this classroom and I'm teaching kids, I'm not going to just keep, teach kids material that is heteronormative. Out of curiosity, it sounds like what you're saying is you want to be able to introduce all ways of life. Like these, yeah. these are the people that are that you will encounter with, with throughout life. That is what I'm arguing, yes. So would it be okay to include a book with a man having a relationship with a 12 year old in that book? I know See, it's extreme. No. Hold on, but just no, hear me out. Because now hear you're equipped getting gay people to no. pedophiles. No, no, I'm not. And no, I, that's I'm, not who no, 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 you're, not. you're drawing a line that I'm not, that I'm not drawing. And, the and you're definitely I, crossing the line. I, I agree, never I agree crossed. it is. I agree, and this is why I'm bringing it up, is who establishes the boundary? The law. But, but what Period. law? The law, the law is... The law. But the law that's been signed no, in is no, some No, 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 state. I'm sorry, no, there's laws against, between adults having sex with children. Now, if a student had two parents who happened to be of the same sex, I'm not going to sit there and discount who they are in my class. I cannot do that. I sign a contract. I would never ask anybody to uplift or suppress any child. I want there to be equality in the classroom. What I am saying is that there are factual instances where this is being taught in classrooms. I pulled my children out of public school because there are so many instances of this happening. I am a parent. I'm looking in the book bag every day. I'm checking in with homework. I am talking to the teachers and the, the, the principals and I'm involved. But we didn't know that, you know, during class there were images shown of literal sex acts or describing certain situations that were inappropriate for young children. We have a belief system at home and the children want to break the boundaries of that belief system naturally because we're human beings. That's just what we do. And we're trying to confine them to a set of beliefs to say this is what is right in our home. And we're seeing the schools get funding from a Planned Parenthood. And they tried to pass a bill to put uh, medical facilities to offer abortions in high schools here in California. And it all, it's gradual, right? It starts with this is a book that has two dads. This is a book with two moms. This is, and it's just a gradual curiosity that could leverage and break away that child from the, the root in the home. My education growing up was fully public education. College is where I started getting a curiosity for, for truth and education. And I think I'm so passionate about the education system today because it is obviously broken, but how do we fix it? Many of these progressive ideas in fixing it is just more empathy, empathy, sympathy, safety. But in reality, I see the public school system isn't actually accomplishing the goal of what education is, which is teaching critical thinking, how to understand, how to ask good questions, and then comprehend how to problem solve. There was a high school down the street from where I live in Los Angeles that encouraged all the kids of color to apply for their school play and only once all the kids of color received whatever positions they wanted, then the white kids could apply. That, in my opinion, is an example of 
discrimination. The fact that we now have Harvard has black only kids dorms, that to me is segregation. With affirmative action, we've seen with Harvard lawsuits and other things, how it's backfiring and it's picking and choosing of which minorities can and cannot have success. It was done to try to create or make up for the wrongs of our past, but I think it's really backfired. Yeah, it's really, I mean, excluding those excelling students in other races. To fix the problems of the past, like you said, but I, th I think the past, there were a lot of minorities that were excelling and doing really well. Despite the foot of the exactly. government. On, exactly. And like, yes. kudos to them. Yes. yes. In incredible, strong human beings. And we should have that discrimination in any way anymore. But unfortunately, it has become a discrimination against other groups. Yeah, it's racism. It's, mm -hmm. It is racism. When if, you, if you are taking a group of people and judging them on their race and setting them aside, giving them a special treatment, if you are uplifting a person or you are trying to suppress a person because of their race, that is racism. So we're supposed to believe that someone like... Um, Barack Obama's children are like struggling because they're black. Like that's ridiculous. So I pulled my oldest daughter out um, a public school in Florida. We were having debates about pulling down statues and changing names and, and some of the school board members and some of the activist groups were saying that black children could not learn because of names on buildings. And that is completely asinine to me. Uh, it basically says that because we have a higher level of melanin, somehow our brains don't work. Every other kid could walk into the building and get the education that they needed, but somehow not for you black children. And I found that to be just disgusting. And I did not want my children to have any type of idea coming from authority figures who believed in such things like that. First of all, I would like to say that um, affirmative action programs, the biggest beneficiary according to the data, and this has been government data, has been white women first and foremost. Second of all, I would never use Obama, Barack Obama's kids as a barometer for anything because they do have privilege as well as Will Smith kids. But if we talk about Laquan, just down, Laquan Smith down the street that nobody knows, there will be some impediments based on his race. Yeah. Why? Why do you, how because do you know that? Because people, because people do tend to look and see race. Uh, what you were talking about is just racism, but there's a, when it's institutional and structural, it, it does something totally different. And when, and when the black wealth gap is 100 years behind the white wealth gap in America, it'll take 100 years to catch up. Why do you think that's because of racism, though? You take one thing and say that is the cause for every person of color. The data that, bears that, out. What data? What data uh, is saying that black, science black is, people are behind? Because there are many black people that aren't behind, that are doing well, much better than other people. You're, so, no, you're absolutely right. And there are outliers in every single community. Right. There are very strong you know, members of the black community that are very affluent. There are also a majority that live in poverty. And if we see a, a bunch of cities that are majority person of color, and we're trying to recognize why have these places stayed at a very uh, stable poverty line. But there are systemic reasons to why these communities are like that. How would you, how would you I say would that, say that. probably because of policies that, uh, that are that's in that's those racist, cities. That's racist policies. Absolutely. Hold on, we got to define I, terms. When would you say that Watts and Compton became the way that it is? Was it like that no. in the 40s and 50s? Would, no, it's a growth because no, 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 I'm of asking policies you, from when, redlining policies that were enabled. In places. California? Yeah, absolutely. And California put in racist policies. I'm, I would never deny that. All of these supposed uh, solutions are actually hurting. Wouldn't a better solution be to teach our kids that we're all born in the image of God? We should all treat well, one another equally. And if you are act or if you don't okay, believe in God, should be then we're all, equal with and we're all, and we're all equal, right? If you come from a poor neighborhood, whether you're black or Hispanic or, or an immigrant from anywhere, obviously you don't have the same privileges that somebody who comes from a wealthy community, but that has nothing to do with your color. I don't think that if you're an impoverished black kid or you're an impoverished white kid, one should receive a resource and the other, other shouldn't. Would you say that, that it's economic then is the reason that causes these disparities? Economic, but I don't think it's but, related to color. But would you say if there's a majority of a particular group that lies underneath the poverty line in economic, that, that has, race has any Anything to do with that? It is what could, you're it could, but that it's it's just not blanket. You don't know. And why don't we look at the families, the black families, who have done those amazing things in this country, and study what they did to succeed instead of just focusing on 
oh, well, black people are behind and we don't even know what to do. Well, why don't we just go and look? Since you are a professor, wouldn't that be, you go and look at what has worked. Well, I would, I would never just go to you <laughs> and just look at you. I, again, and I'm sorry, it's just the reality of the data. And so what I share- Data can be broken up in, okay, in umpteen different ways. Uh, no, okay. Yes, it no, can. Actually, actually, you, you're a professor data. and you're saying That's that data cannot data. be manipulated? I, I give, this, I don't this is why data. my kids do not I, go I to public school anymore. I don't, and I'm glad they don't. I just think it's interesting. I'm thinking of like an anecdotal story I have. Last year, the school that I taught at, Deep East Oakland. I serve majority black and brown students, over 70% of our families under the poverty line. These are some of the hardest working people I have ever seen in my life. They get up, they have two or three jobs, three or four children. In because this, of, I would argue, because, because, of, because of their economic no, status, because of, right? Because of liberal uh, policies that is, is the government telling them that they can and cannot succeed because of how high our property taxes are here, because we do not have school choice where they can take their dollars somewhere else. If you put those same families in redder districts in the country, like places in Florida and Texas or Virginia, where they have better options for their family, you would definitely see them be able and to succeed. And where black and brown children are still underperforming in schools? But coming from Florida, the school that I was at, it's graded from like A to like D, F. Mm -hmm. When I started there, it was a C school. Very poor performing. And technically, sure, they have school choice. They don't have state tests anymore. But they're still so badly performing. Mm -hmm. The community of it, black, brown, very little white students in that community. But not to say that student of color can't be more affluent, but um, I think it's ridiculous to kind of say that color doesn't play a part into disparities and um, just disadvantages. So in Florida, a lot of people that I had encountered weren't kind to others, and sometimes I would have coworkers call students retarded and using racist slurs and things like that. And from my standpoint, hearing something like that, it disgusted me. My coworkers very quickly were able to kind of distinguish me from the rest, like, if I was going to come to the teacher's lounge, more hushed conversation, people wouldn't share as much as they used to just because I would call out behavior like that. Teachers with guns make schools safer. You know what? I'm going to disagree. <laughs> so I was really in between. I didn't really know how I felt about this issue at first. Um, but then I started looking at uh, places that had armed their teachers. So I believe that model is good. It has to be voluntary. Yes. So the teachers have to want to do it themselves. They have to be well trained. Yes. They have to have uh, background checks periodically. That has been successful. If, if we're trusting teachers, which in some cases we do, in some cases we don't, but if my mindset is that if we're gonna trust teachers to mold our children's minds and educate them, they're there for eight hours a day. We should also trust and kind of enable them to protect themselves and our kids physically. I think by no means should we ever force a teacher to carry a gun, but if a, a teacher is willing to take on the responsibility of learning how to handle a weapon properly, I think that we should allow them to do that for us, and it frankly would be an incredible service to us. All right, so just to break it open, this conversation is so much more nuanced than to arm or not to arm. And if you want to save a school, you need to get parental engagement. Let's look at the mindset of the individuals that are going into these homes with firearms. Those individuals are not mentally okay. There's something wrong at happening, whether it's at school, in the house, whether it's, who knows, maybe it's the, something they're consuming online. And I think that's the parent's job to continue to engage to make sure that child is healthy. A lot of these kids as well that are going into schools that are not mentally um, healthy, they, they're coming from single parent households. They're coming, they're living with their grandparents. There's something, there's something intrinsically with their identity that's broken. And I think that whether you arm a school or you don't, it's not gonna change it if you don't address the real issue. I agree with you that people yeah. that are, you know, perpetrating these crimes and these like mass casualties are messed up individuals, I would absolutely agree. Uh, mass shootings are a uniquely American problem. So if we try to understand what's the root, why is America solely have that problem, I would say it's a gun culture problem. So if the idea is, you know, should we try to remove aspects of gun culture that really purvey in our society, um, should we do that or should we just increase the amount of firearms we can have in every single space just so that way we're properly ready for just, a gunfight whenever I want to clarify up. gun culture. Are you saying that there's like the shoot 'em up bang 'em up video games? Are you saying No, I wouldn't say it's video games. I'd say institutions like the NRA that heavily impose, you know, you need to own not just firearms but as many firearms as you can. I personally would not like to be armed. Uh, I do not want to take lethal action in the classroom and I, I want to make it a safe and inclusive environment. 
Army teachers is a response measure to particular violence that goes on in our schools here in America. And personally, I think we should focus more towards solutions to prevent these occurrences from happening, rather than just implementing responses implying that these actions will occur. I, and I'm just gonna be honest with you, you don't want me to have a gun, because I, I had to go back to therapy in the last few months, and so I agree with a lot of what you guys are saying, what your plan was, but I would also say mental health. We gotta understand, some of these school shootings are done because people have snapped. People have natural biases and things like that, and people could act on those biases. Then they could be guns drawn and not a clear mind, you know? Like as a parent, how would you feel knowing that you don't know which teachers have a gun and you've had bad experiences with prior teachers? What if that teacher oh. that absolutely, you know, so blown my answer, up kind my of thing? answer, my answer to your question is I feel the same way about the guard in front of my kid's school. I don't really know the guard, but he's gone through training and I presume that he knows what he's doing. And frankly, I feel the same way about a police officer. I don't need the police officer, but they've gone through training and they were willing to take on that responsibility. And so I would apply the same logic. It's so interesting that you bring that up because it really ties back to why I feel like we need to be careful about how much responsibility we're saddling teachers with teaching our kids values, right? On the one hand, the system is saying, trust our teachers, they know better than you parents. We should be able to teach them what they need to know about sexuality. On the other hand, you guys are admitting that Many teachers are not really uh, checked for mental issues. We don't really know what is happening in these classrooms. I'm not we saying don't that know teachers about what are not friction. checked. We very frequently have like professional development days where we got self care. So I wouldn't say many by any means. And when I'm coming into the workplace, I'm not bringing in all my baggage as to say, you know, you go into your work, you're not like, oh, I'm so depressed, my kid's this, this, So that. why, if there is a teacher who is willing to step forward and will go through the training and will go through the screening, why not empower them to save, to save our kids? I mean, in Uvalde, if there was a teacher who could actually save those children, then maybe we would not have seen so much death. When we place teachers with a firearm in the classroom, it takes the instance of a violent occurrence from a possibility in the minds of these children to an inevitability. But in the, the children don't children. know. It is a concealed and carry weapon that has gone through the process of the local sheriff's department, background check, training, yeah, checkups, everything. No one knows everything. but the teacher no one knows. and the, the I, um, police department. I have a logistical question. Yeah. Does this teacher have the gun on them? Yes. You wouldn't it know. is holstered all, on them? All yeah. At all times. It's a concealed okay. carry. You, it should so just, never just be in a place of a child. Concealed carry. It's illegal no, to I know what a concealed carry is. My thing, and why I, why this question sort of enrages me. Why are we asking teachers to carry guns? When did this become an occupational hazard? When did we walk into school and people were like, by the way, you could be shot today, so maybe you want to have your Glock strapped on you because who knows, this might be your last day on earth. That is ridiculous. If you 50 years ago were to look at a teacher and be like, hey, do you want to hold this gun with you? You know, like you might need it. They're going to scratch their heads and look at you funny. This is opening up a bigger conversation, right? But I think that even though it is voluntary, right, we still need to have this conversation. Like it still needs to happen of why, even if a teacher was willing to carry a gun to school, they are even having to be asked to do that in the first place. Teachers are not paid enough. Every day I wake up and I hand to you guys the most precious thing in my entire life, my children. I think that it's important that our society will reflect how much we value you guys. I think that you should receive bonuses if you do a great job. If you're able to represent all of us as Americans, both conservatives and liberals, and you're able to speak on our behalf and take care of our children, we should reward you for that and you should feel rewarded for that. And so I don't know exactly what you make, but I think it is really important that we, we invest in you and we pour into you. And when I see the entire budget that the state of California, for example, spends on education, and I realize that a sliver fraction of it only goes to you guys, it breaks my heart and frankly, makes me so angry. I don't need more bureaucrats. I need more good teachers. I, I left the K through 12 and went to the community college and I do, I do pretty well. I'm not, I'm, so I'm gonna be clear with that, but also I have a so master's. So you're not oppressed, thank so God. So I'm, I'm I'm, I have a master's, but I had to work really hard to get where I'm at. Of but, course. Um, I, but I'm also in a doctoral program and you're right, I'm paying out of pocket too. Again, I had a student that day saying I can't pay my electric bill. How much is your electric bill? I'll pay your electric bill. And so I put up students in hotels because they have nowhere to live. I have a student who doesn't have a family. I, you know, he, he told me the other day, I, want, I need a dad. I said, I'll be your father because it just broke my heart that a 19 year old is in this world alone, doesn't have family. 
Yeah, I would be scared to like calculate how much I spent in my for my classroom, right? Yes. Like all the materials, all the things that I'm purchasing, all the things that I'm doing. And it's just interesting to think that we are always told like teachers are heroes. They're teaching the youth of America, but also we're not going to give you enough money to survive comfortably. Like you're going to struggle every day. There have been days when I go to work and I'm like, am I going to have money to put gas in my car? I guess we're going to find out, right? And I know so many other teachers who are struggling to keep afloat. I can't even imagine having a, I can't even think about having a family as a teacher. I think that growing up, I was not the strongest student. I didn't necessarily see the point in what we were doing. And I think that ultimately that felt like it was because education was something that I had to get through not necessarily something that I was obtaining. But I think what really pushed me to go into teaching was wanting to give kids a space where they didn't feel the way I feel growing up, where they felt like they had power to make choice in their education and that their education could be powerful in aiding them to do what they wanted to do. So I'm not a teacher. I don't know how much you guys make. And I'm not going to use you as the example. I'm going to use a friend of mine. She's been at a, a school for a number of years. I want to say it's six, seven, eight years. And she's become tenured. And through her tenureship, she's accumulated so much wealth. I'm appalled at how much she's making because she teaches Spanish to sixth graders. And she's making over $150,000 a year. Can I ask you a question? What kind of school does she work at? Public school. Interesting. Yeah. And it, so I mean, how me, much it, experience goes on with that, too? It must, I'm assuming, because yeah. you've invested into your career, which I right. think everybody should. But for me, I look at it as you're making $150,000 in nine months. I, I uh, the prompt very clearly was, are teachers paid enough? Yes. And I mean, we're not. I've had to work second jobs doing DoorDash mm -hmm. just because I wasn't making enough. I'm, if you look at these shoes, they are ripped. They are broken. From a teacher wish list, I could not even buy these shoes myself. You know what I'm saying? Sure. I don't make enough money. So I wanted to clarify, this isn't an absolute. I'm not saying that every teacher is paid enough. I have no idea what your salary is. I have no idea any of those details. I'm just recognizing that if a teacher is getting nine months and their salary is in nine months, they get a summer off. Most, most of society isn't given three months to just That's go That's assuming they have three months. I'm an 11 month employee for one whole month out of the year. I'm not paid anything, Same. nothing. I have to figure out my funds, save money that I don't have to try to supply for a month, month and a half. I, I don't get supplementary, supplementary income. Like, that doesn't happen. Critical race theory is anti-American. Well, I'll go first. Uh, my daughter, uh, same teacher, actually, who was asking about her pronouns, she said that she was going to be introducing some race-themed books. My daughter recorded this conversation in class. So what proceeded to happen is she started to talk to the children uh, in their, uh, I guess, identity groups. Oh, as an African-American child, how are you discriminated against? As an Asian child, she went through all of, except white people. It became total chaos in the classroom. Like, there was no education going on here. There were, they were just literally going at each other, talking about how, who was more oppressed. It's not a matter of if something was racist, it's a matter of when something was racist or how the racist thing happened. So they automatically assume, critical race theorists, that racism is embedded into every single thing. How do you look a child, specifically a black child, in the eye and tell them, I'm sorry for you because of your skin color? There's no hope for you in the greatest country, literally for them, because black Americans are the most successful black people in the entire world. And then turn around and look at a white child and say, sorry, you're responsible for, our, for the atrocities of 200 years all, ago. All I have to add to that is that in our home and with our faith, I teach my children that it is um, awful to make someone feel hopeless or pitied. You're damning them to a future of failure yes. if you are telling them, oh, I pity you and I'm going to do these things for you instead of coming alongside them and supporting them and doing something for themselves that pulls them out of that hopelessness. And I think that those are two of the worst things that we can do as a broader society. You know what I love about America? My mother immigrated from Morocco. She's a Jewish person. Everywhere around the world, we're known as the Jew. In America, we're known as American. And I think there's something so powerful about empowering any community to be American and to succeed based on your own merit. We don't look back into why we can't. We look into why we can. And so when my family taught me since I was a little girl, I can, I can, I can, I learned that I could. And that's why I think this country has empowered me so much. I want to see the same thing for kids of all colors in the United States. But if we're taught, if we're teaching them that there is no hope for them and that people will always 
look at them in a different way, then how are they going to hear the message of I can? My question for liberal teachers is do they think that it's the right place for them to impose liberal ideas in classrooms knowing that they have many students who come from conservative families? And I find that many of the schools have become battlegrounds for those kinds of ideas. And when teachers are bringing those issues to the classrooms, it's forcing families and conservative kids to have to address these issues. And we believe that they're simply too young to deal with those kinds of complex um, matters at that age. Okay, so first of all, I think we need to define what critical race theory is. Critical race theory is a theory that Derrick Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw and a bunch of uh, former Harvard Law students came up with, where they theorized that within certain American laws, racism is just embedded. And so I've, I'm sorry for your experience, because you shouldn't have to go through that. Nobody should have to go through that. I don't tell my son you can't do anything. I have told my son you have to work twice as hard. I have to tell my son, you're a black man in America, you need to, there are certain things you need to do to survive. I mean, first, I think the idea that we are teaching children in critical race theory in schools is ridiculous. As he pointed out, this is a high level, like university level framework. You are not gonna walk into like Isabel's elementary school fifth grade classroom and see Isabel telling these people about the legal structures. In my opinion, how I define myself as an American, right? I define myself as someone who is proud of my country, someone who can look at the mistakes that my country has made in the past and the things that are keeping other people oppressed and recognize that these are still existing and that we need to work towards changing that. So I don't see how critical race theory could be anti-American because that's how I define American. And I think it's very nuanced because people define American in many different ways, I actually right? don't completely disagree with your definition of it. I think that maybe you think it's systemic and I think it's the individual. But I think that even in nuanced ways, like the example that she gave, I've heard examples where my nieces have been segregated in the classroom at fourth and fifth grade. And like, well, did this happen to you? Do you have a two parent home? Are your grandparents raising you? And like, there's this line of victimhood. And as a woman that has dealt with sexism, I do definitely teach my daughters, like as a girl in this country, it is going to be a different experience than your father had. Um, but I don't think it's beneficial at all to kind of institute that victimhood in their long-term mentality because then you actually start to see kids that are like, oh, well, they're different than me, so therefore their life could be better or worse than mine. And instead of engaging with those people, they step away. I don't believe that there's a victimhood to it. I think it's just kind of amplifying that, hey, this is the truth, this is what happens, and let's move forward with that. Having that knowledge to be able to kind of navigate through life is better than just, oh, well, I assume I'm the same as, you know, my white counterpart. Oh, why is she able to do this? Why does she have this opportunity that I don't have? But they're the same. But she has that opportunity. They are the same, is what we're saying. I think what I, the difference is, we're stating normative statements, and you guys are claiming that we're presenting prescriptive claims. So the normative statement that we're presenting is, these events happen in American history. These are the outcomes that have led from those events. What you guys are saying is, we're then adding prescriptive statements, which is, that's why you should never really try, because you'll never make it in this country. That's right. not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that if you negatively press a child with these thoughts, that will be the outcome because that's how human beings work. This is a psychological fact. The quality of education is the government's job. I believe it is the government's job. Look, our funding comes through government. I mean, our schools are government entities. So it Policy. is. Policies are government. Everything's government. I mean, if you're in public education, you're in government. That's we're bureaucrats. That's literally our job. So it is government's job. So yeah, I, I believe it is. I believe it is the job of, of the government because schools are government. That's literally what they are. They're government institutions. Yes, I completely agree. Government provides a certain quality to education. Obviously, they haven't provided those funds, they haven't provided those policies that are pro-teacher or anything like that. So it really shows in our education, in kids, in all around, we're just not at the quality that other countries are at.
I was going back and forth because what a government is, you know, oftentimes is characterized as like this entity of like a group of people up there deciding what goes on. Where no, like government is just collective organization. Does the government have a role in education? Absolutely. Uh, I think that parents have to play a role as well and you know, not only being involved with what their kid is learning in school, uh, but also, you know, reinforcing strong educational skills. Um, and that doesn't happen unless there is parent involvement. I know the kids that are being worked on at home versus the kids that aren't. Uh, and it plays out in test scores, it plays out in their engagement in class, and it plays out in their behavior. You have to remember that we're a representative government, that it's based on the people, right? And so these public school systems are waiting for the parents to come in and say, this curriculum is not what I want to teach my kids. We, the taxpayers, control the curriculum. But the problem is we haven't been engaging in that system because we've been so distracted and, and, and pulled away from the education from our kids. No, I would agree. The communities need to absolutely be more involved in their school boards and what's going on in education. And unfortunately, we don't have that. And oftentimes, a lot of politicians, albeit Republicans that are trying to cut a lot of social programs and a lot of social investment, as well as corporate Democrats who want to cut a lot of social investment, uh, both of those, you know, we see areas of corruption within our education system. Well, and let, let's be clear on what we're talking about government is. So when we talk about a local, on a local level, it is government. That's literally what government is. When your kid goes into the school, they're going into a government institution. So I think when we're talking, we're not talking about parents not being involved. I want you involved. Heck, please be involved. So I think our issue, when we were talking about government, we weren't talking about excluding parents. We were talking about it is government's job to make this entity, which is public education, function. It has to. If government's not involved, you have no money. So you guys teach in government schools, public schools. Essentially, you're teaching a diverse student body. You have conservatives, you have liberals. How can you better represent us, half of this country? It's sadly causing us to lose faith in you guys. We want to support you guys. We want to send our kids to your schools and your classrooms. And I think that when we talk about all these differences, you know, how do we um, sort of represent both of these sides, right? How do we bring these people together? I think it's also really important to remember that historically, this curriculum is one-sided in favor of conservative views in favor of supporting white students, not students of color, right? And so I think that we really, as a country, need to take a look at our education system. I think we can all agree that there needs to be a lot of change in the system, right? And look at how we can build a system that represents, reflects, validates the experiences and identities of everybody. Beautiful. That was good, girl.